Well, let's do some reading together from the Scripture. James 2.14, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? We could ask, can that kind of faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give him the things that are needful for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith also without, or so faith without works is dead also. So that's the reading of James 2, 14 through 26. We said early on, I forget now, I think maybe it was in October, starting along and then when we were doing some of these lessons, maybe before that. We said what James is wanting to do, he's writing brethren. These are brethren that he's greeting that are dispersed and, and could, could mean all over the, the area from which in Old Testament times the, the, the dispersion had taken place. Some suggest that it's referring to Acts 8 when the church was scattered because of persecution. But either way, these are, these are Jewish brethren. They're, they're Christians, but they're Jewish Christians living in different locales, and James is writing them. So they're, they're already children of God, but he wants to bring them to maturity. You heard me say a number of times that the Great Commission has two parts. The first part of the Great Commission, whereby the gospel is taught, And one comes to a point of faith and complies with God's will, meaning by that he repents of his sins, he confesses his faith in Christ, and he's baptized into Christ. That's part one of the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But in Matthew 28, in the given the Great Commission there, Jesus said, Go and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Then he says, Verse 19 of Matthew 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And that part is really defining what we do the rest of our lives. It's a growth process. We're growing up unto him who is head, that is Christ, as Ephesians, the fourth chapter says. It's so well illustrated in Acts 2, verse 41, they that gladly received the word were baptized And there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. But verse 42 says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. So James is writing people that have obeyed the, the gospel. That part one is there. But he's involved in, in bringing to maturity, in, in completing that work that God has begun in us. And all of us have to look at it that way, that that we're on a spiritual journey that uh, more and more like Jesus and the the concept of completion, of of maturation, it's not going to take place automatically. It's very possible for a person to just stop growing spiritually. It's possible for a person not only to not grow and and improve and, and develop, but even to retrogress and, and to go backwards and, and lose some things like the Hebrew Christians, when by reason of time you ought to be teachers. 
Hebrews 5 says, beginning at verse 12, you have need that someone teach you again that which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And so this maturation process, this becoming complete and mature in the faith, James is very concerned about that from the very outset in the very first chapter, in the very first few verses when he even talks about count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. The reason for that, he says, is because the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That doesn't mean sinlessly perfect, though we should always strive not to sin. But it's a thing having all of its parts. It's complete. It's maturation. And, and that's what James is, is doing. So here we have this matter of, of the kind of faith that God wants. And, and how do we approach that? How do we identify with what God wants when it comes to saving faith? This isn't talking so much about what you must do to become a Christian. We're, going, uh, we're not going to leave that part out. But he's not writing to them about obeying the first principles of the gospel. But now that they've done that, what kind of faith must they as brethren in Christ have? The importance of faith cannot be over, overemphasized. We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. That's, that's, a, that's a comforting passage. That's talking about things that we know. That though the outer man perishes, the inner man is renewed day by day. Isn't that comforting to know that? And that if this earthly house is dissolved, we know we have a house built without hands, eternal in the heavens. How do we know those things? Because God has said this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we know things that are the purpose of this life. We know that are things that are going to happen once this life is over. We know the promises of God. And that's all of that's in 2 Corinthians, the latter part of chapter 4 and in chapter 5, when he says, for we walk by faith not by sight. So that's so important. Without faith, it's impossible to be pleasing to God. But I'm pursuing what kind of faith is if it saves. And the first thing that James talks about is what he calls a dead faith. Actually, that, that expression occurs three times in the paragraph we just read. Let's look at that again. In verse 17, faith by itself, it does, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 20, do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And then again in verse 26, the latter part of the verse, so faith without works is dead also. So three times in this passage, he makes reference to dead faith. And all of us should recoil at that idea. All of us, when we see here's a passage that's, talk, that's talking about a dead faith, we should immediately say, well, I know that's not pleasing to God, and that's not what I want to have. So what does he say about dead faith? Well, dead faith is not necessarily where a person is ignorant of, of Scripture. Let me, let me put it to you this way. A person could quote the Scripture and have dead faith. A person can know the right answers and have dead faith. When we start thinking that our words are as good as works, that you can substitute words for deeds, you can have a wealth of knowledge. You can know a lot of things. But that's dead faith. What James is so, one of the things he's so adept at, so good at, and, and does so much, it's just a short book of five chapters. But he, he uses illustrations. Like in our lesson last Sunday evening, we were talking about James 2, the first part of it. Having faith, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and having it without partiality. But he used an illustration so that you don't just say, well, yeah, that's right, we shouldn't show respect to persons. He talked about somebody coming in to an assembly, coming into a place where the church was meeting, one has 
every indication of wealth with gold rings and fine apparel. And the other fellow comes in with vile clothing. And he just imagined that scenario of, of how uh, deference would be shown, all kinds of deference to the one who has uh, evidence of wealth. And the other one, it's like, you know, go over there in the corner somewhere or, or get down here on the floor by my, by my feet. And so it's, it's just an illustration. That's just one of the ways you could show partiality, but it, it makes it... See, what we, what we don't need is something that stays abstract. What we need is something concrete. We need to see the point. Oh, that's what he's talking about. Well, he does the same thing here when it comes to faith. He gives an example. And that's the way we learn. We learn with illustrations. Here a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. So here somebody doesn't have adequate clothing. Maybe it's a night like this, where it's in the 20s, with a wind chill factor way down low, and one just has rags. Just inadequate clothing, doesn't have clothing to, to meet the needs of the body. Doesn't have food. And what you say is, one of you says in verse 16, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. I was doing some reading on the, in, from the NIV, the New International Version. And here's the way it, it renders verse 16. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed. And that's all you do. I wish you well. Hope everything turns out all right for you. But you do not give them the things that are needful for the body. The NIV says, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? You know, when we're, you know, people have, people have different ideas about uh, uh, essentials of life. But this is talking about essentials of life. The most, the most basic necessities, James identifies it here when he, when he identifies food and clothing. That's the way Paul worded it in 1 Timothy chapter 6 when he says, having food and raiment, we shall therewith be content. Or when Jesus says, don't be like the Gentiles that are saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? He says, your father knows that you need these things. But there again in Matthew 6 verse 31 and 32 He's talking about what we would call the essentials of life. As I say, uh, I get calls from people that uh, their idea of the essentials of life and what they need help on, I mean, they, uh, they want the church to pay their electricity bill. They want the church to, uh, you know, here it is this time of year, and so they want the church to h help them provide Christmas. Do you know I get calls like that? You know, we, we, we need some, some funding for so we can have Christmas this year. It kind of reminds me of my friend Raymond Harville. Uh, somebody called him, somebody called him um, asking for a benevolence, and he was talking to them, trying to find out a little bit more information. And they said, Whoop, ho hold on just a minute, I'm getting another call. Now you th think about this picture. They've got a, they've got a phone, and, and they've got services on their phone, like call waiting. And oh, hold on just a minute, I've got another call here while we're talking about, you know, you, you providing for my, for my needs. And so we have to have a couple of cars. And we, you know, so on it goes. But the, the fact is there are essentials of life. There are basic needs. And that's what James is talking about. He's not talking about everything everybody thinks is something they've just got to have. Or it would be the end of the world. You know, there was a time when everybody didn't have their personal cell phone. There really was a time like that. I've been, I'm certainly not alone, but I've, I've been to parts of the world where people are just amazed if you have a car. They're amazed if you own a house of any kind. But James is talking about when you get right down to it, basics. And this is just a, a, an opportunity that might provide itself. Jesus anticipated this in Matthew chapter 25. You remember when he talks about some of the criteria on the day of judgment. And those on the right hand, the king will say to them in Matthew 25, verse 36, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick. 
and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Well, there are other things in the passage. And this is a great place, if I had time to develop this thought, which I don't, to talk about the need for contextual Bible study. You know what people do with this passage sometimes? They say, well, here, look at this passage. And so the church ought to have a prison ministry. You know, I was in prison, and you visited me. You came to me. So the church should have a prison ministry. You know, I've seen material mailed out, and this is the passage quoted to deal with a prison ministry. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for going to prisons and studying the Bible with people. But I also care about looking at passages in their context. And studying the Bible with, with prisoners that are incarcerated because of violating the law has not one thing to do with what this passage says. This is talking about those who are going forth for his name's sake. These are brethren, and they're not guilty of wrongdoing. They're suffering as a Christian. They were beaten. They were imprisoned. It's the kind of thing like Paul and Silas. When they're beaten and their feet are made fast in the socks, they're in prison like that. And as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, let none of you suffer as an evildoer. But that's not really my topic. I'm just saying that's a good case in point to say he's talking about things that will be considered visiting the sick with this part about clothing the naked and feeding the hungry. That's part of it. That's so very practical. And Jesus says, Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these my brethren, you did it unto me. Now, Galatians 6 and verse 10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do that which is good unto all men, especially to those of the household of faith. And so there are passages that uh, would say, as you have opportunity, any who come in your path, you, you individually can extend help to them. But James is talking, if a brother or sister, that's, the, that's his wording, a brother or sister is naked, destitute of clothing, destitute of food. Jesus says, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren. These passages here are specific and not just general benevolence out in the world. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. But this is talking about your brother in Christ. That's the primary responsibility. Especially of the household of faith, as Paul would say. And again, all that is serving here in James 2 is just an illustration. You can know passages that say what you ought to do. You can come up with all these right answers. But when you start thinking that your words take the place of deeds, you miss the point. And it's so easy for one to do that, to congratulate himself because he knows the truth. He, he knows the way of righteousness. And he can talk about things we ought to do and we can plan and we can talk. But our talk is not a substitute for action. And so James is, is making that point here when it comes to helping a brother or sister that needs the necessities of life. But he uses another illustration. Not only is that kind of work dead faith, he talks about the demons to make the point from another perspective. Look at what the text says in verse 19. As he amplifies this concept of having faith but not having works to go with it. Not, and by works here he means action, obedience, not just doing something, not just activity. But the scriptures furnish us completely to every good work. It's what the scriptures would say we should be doing as works that he's talking about. So in verse 19 you believe that there's one God you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. You, you think about demonic faith. Over in Matthew chapter 8, in the ministry of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus came to the country of the Gergesenes, that's in the Decapolis on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, there were two demon-possessed men and these demons cried out in verse 29, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Do you know that the demons know what's coming? 
Do you know that they understand that, that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels? But here's the ministry of Christ. And they feared the Lord. Have you come to torment us before the time? They believe. You, don't, you do not have any atheist among the demons. You do not have any agnostics among the demons. In that demonic realm, every single one is a believer in God. And they fear and they tremble. But look at where they're at. They're in everlasting chains under darkness, reserved unto judgment for the great day. And so what do we have? Well, we have a, a faith that talks, that thinks you can substitute talk and words for deeds. But now, we might call that intellectual faith. Do you know anyone like that? With intellectual faith. But now he's talking about emotional faith. Faith where, where they also tremble. And so there, there's that element of, of being impacted and, and even being emotional. But still, those demons are where they are because they did not stay in the realm of their proper habitation. It, it's because they're rebellious. It's, it's because... They don't have a faith that obeys what God says. So whether it's an intellectual faith, if it's a faith that trembles and so it's emotional, well, the demons have that, he says. And so if we are to have saving faith, faith that avails, it can't be that, that dead faith that just talks. Go in peace. I hope everything turns out for you. And so you quote him a scripture or two. It can't be faith like the demons have. Well, what does it consist of? And that's, that's when James uses some more illustrations. In fact, he uses two. He talks about Abraham, and he talks about Rahab. And he says, that's what I'm talking about. We are to have the faith that Abraham had. We are to have the faith that Rahab had. You see, saving faith is based on Believing, trusting, and it's faith that leads to action. The faith that saves is the faith that obeys. And that's the kind of faith that Abraham had. When the text says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? That had to be... How, how, can, you, how can you describe what went through Abraham's mind? When after waiting all those years, finally Isaac is born. And now God says in Genesis 22, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and you go and offer him in the place that I will show you. Offer him as a sacrifice to me. Besides not wanting to do that because he's the father and this is my son. The other thing is all these promises God had been making. In your seed all families of the earth will be blessed. I'm going to give to your descendants the land of Canaan. And, and already specifying, you know, it's in Isaac your seed shall be called. And now God says, take him out and offer him as a sacrifice. I don't know what he thought. I know what he did. The text says he rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went to Mount Moriah. And in a sense, we do know what he thought. Because in Hebrews 11 verse 19 it says, Accounting that God was able to raise him from the dead. Which also in a figurative way, he did receive him back from the dead. That's what was going on through his mind. God cannot lie. If I do put him to death as a sacrifice, God will raise him up. It's a faith that trusts God so that we do what God says no matter what it is. If it's easy, if we understand it, that's well and good. If it takes us to difficult places. And we don't even fully understand why God would require this or why he says that. We do that too. That's what Abraham did. That's not superficial faith. That's not faith where you're just talking or having a feeling. That's a faith that is committed to doing what God says. 
And the scripture was fulfilled, verse 23, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You know where that scripture is? That's found in Genesis 15 and verse 6. But do you know what has happened before that? Abraham has left Ur of the Chaldees. He's left Babylon. Today that would be southern Iraq. To go to a place that God would show him. And he left not knowing where that might be. But he obeyed God and he ended up in what we know as the land of Canaan. And standing with his feet planted at Shechem in Genesis 12 and verse 6. In verse 7, God said, unto thy seed I will give this land. He's already left home. He's already left family. He's gone to the place that God would show him. And then in that chapter of Genesis 15, that's three chapters later, God is renewing those promises and the text says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But here again, that's in a context of where this man had done what God said. If God says, I want you to leave what is familiar, your surroundings, Ur of the Chaldees excavation has been done, highly developed. Here is civilization. And what's going to happen is he's going to dwell in a tent and be a sojourner and not own anything in the land except a burial place. He believed God. The writer of Hebrews says, if they had been mindful of the country from which they left, they would have had opportunity to return. But Abraham is among those who were looking for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. James is saying, that's the kind of faith I want you to have. A faith that trusts God, a faith that will do what God says, just like Abraham did. And then he mentions Rahab. Here's somebody that did not have the opportunities that a lot of people would have have, had. She grew up in a pagan society, and yet she had heard about the true God. And she had faith in God. And she risked everything to identify with the people of God. And so Hebrews 11 will say she did not perish among those that were disobedient. She showed her faith. She put her life on the line as she received those Israelite messengers and hid them and protected them. And she and her family were spared when Jericho was destroyed. And when you read in Matthew chapter 1, the lineage of Christ, her name is there. She's in the lineage of Christ as it turns out. So God used her to, to help accomplish his purpose. But she didn't just say, I've heard about God. She put her money where her mouth was. There were actions that followed. She, she did, according to the life that she had, she acted on the basis of her faith. Now I want to close out our study. You see, it's possible, very much so, and James doesn't want us to be like this, but in Titus 1 and verse 16, Paul speaks of some who profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. And so we can profess that we know God and our, in our behavior deny Him, or in our lack of obedience deny Him. We don't want to do that. You heard me bring a lesson in the past. It's probably time to dust it off and lather it up again. I've got a lesson that I preach on taking inventory. Taking spiritual inventory. Some of you are looking blank enough. I can tell you've not heard that yet. So, to be announced. But it does us good to take spiritual inventory. And Warren Wiersbe has made a list of some nine questions. And I'm going to use those with just very slight adaptation in a couple of places. Dr. Wearsby says, here are some questions we can ask ourselves as we examine our hearts. Number one, was there a time when I honestly realized I was a sinner and admitted this to myself and God? Number two, was there a time when my heart stirred me to flee from the wrath to come? Have I ever seriously been exercised over my sins? And I found myself thinking, if I use that word exercise, people are going to think of working out on weights or something like that. 
So before I changed the wording, I thought, let me look that up in my American Heritage Dictionary. And one of the definitions about number four, as you read there, says to be alarmed, to worry. Page 621. If you're not a child of God, are you worried about that? If you're not a child of God, are you alarmed about that? You really should be. Do I truly understand the gospel that Christ died for my sins and rose again? Do I understand and confess that I cannot save myself? Did I sincerely repent of my sins and turn from them, or do I secretly love sin and want to enjoy it? Number five, have I trusted in Christ for salvation in the biblical sense? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Has there been a change in my life? Number six, do I maintain good works or are my works occasional and weak? Do I seek to grow in the things of the Lord? Can others tell that I've been with Jesus? Number seven, do I have a desire to share Christ with others or am I ashamed of him? Number eight, do I enjoy the fellowship of God's people? Is worship a delight to me? Number nine, am I ready for the Lord's return or will I be ashamed when he comes for me? You see, taking spiritual inventory can assist us in determining our true standing before God. And if we have the kind of faith that James is talking about, not a dead faith, not a demonic faith, but a dynamic faith, a living faith, a trusting faith, an obedient faith. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Satan is a great deceiver, and one of his devices is to convince a person that his faith is real when it is counterfeit. And James is shaking us up. He's waking us up to help us that that not be the case. Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Tonight, are, are you subject to the Lord's invitation? The faith that saves is the faith that obeys. Will you tonight have an obedient faith? Believe in the Lord with all of your heart, repent of your sins, and come to be baptized by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins. Have you strayed from the Lord? If so, you need to come back in repentance and prayer as together we stand and sing.